Hello everyone out there. Welcome. It's another Renaissance Woodworker Live. Uh, just clearing some stuff off the bench here. Got a little project I'm working on, so I need to make some room. Uh, usual live stuff, you know, if people in the chat room, welcome. Um, make sure everyone can hear me okay. In fact, I think I need to turn my sound back a little bit. Um, as always, if you guys have questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat room. If you can, put them in all caps. It makes that heck of a lot easier for me to see them. And uh, today we're going to talk about work holding, specifically, you know, hand tool work holding. This is a hand tool show. So um, just come to really in the last, I'd say, five years or so. So, of course, I'll take questions on any topic, but if you've got something specifically on on how you would go about holding a work, uh, how you would go about holding a project or something along that line, that would be nice. But again, I'm open. We'll talk about anything. Let me move this stuff out of the way. Actually, I think I'll keep it here. Might need it. So, um, first thing to look at is one of the basic tenets of working in a hand tool shop is uh, being able to hold the work for working on the faces of boards, the edges of boards, and the ends of boards. And you know this may sound like real basic 101, but just so that we get our terminology right, the face of the board is the widest surface, that wide face. The edge, then being 90 degrees to that, is that narrower side of the face. And then the ends, that's the end grain. That one's easiest, end, end grain. But it is important, um, I, I run into this a lot, especially on the internet when you're typing back and forth and chatting back and forth, getting your terminology right can be particularly difficult. So if you've got somebody who's talking about saying, hey, I'm working on the front of this tenon or I'm working on the, the, the side, well, what does that mean? And that can actually vary a little bit depending upon where the board is positioned. Moreover, face and edge can be a little confusing when you're dealing with like a perfectly square piece, like this three-way miter that I just cut. These are perfectly square and cross section, so which is the face, which is the edge? You know, that can sometimes be a contextual thing based upon how that piece is used in the project you're working on. But for the easier part of this discussion, if you are milling the face of a board, you need to be able to hold the work in such a way that you have ideally unobstructed access to the entire face. I say ideally because if I'm cutting a dado on the face of a board, I don't really need to have unobstructed access to the entire face, just unobstructed access to that area around the dado or an area wide enough for my router plane to work all the way across the, that, that joint. So face work, very, very important for milling primarily. Edge work, this is when we're squaring an edge of a board or maybe creating a wider panel and we need to match plane or joint these edges to be glued up into that wider panel. So how do we deal with edges? And how do we deal with edges on, you know, six inch wide boards like this or 12 inch wide boards or one inch wide boards? That can vary uh, quite a bit based upon the size. And then we have the ends of boards. If it's just chewing up the end with a hand plane or more likely cutting joinery on the end. Say I've got to cut a tenon on the end of this. How do I position this board upright in such a way to be able to resist the sawing force that goes into it? Could be very different if you're working the end and you're putting a rabbit on the end of this. Now it's kind of halfway between end work and face work, but it all boils down to those three things, face, edge, and end. How do we do that? And this goes back to kind of workbench design Everybody loves workbenches. Everybody likes to talk about vices and talk about all the different doodads and gizmos that we put on our workbench. And that's really what we should be talking about is face, edge, and end. And there's an old um, adage, the, the door test. If you were building a full-size door, exterior or interior door, would your workbench be able to hold all the various pieces on there? So kind of reverse engineering, starting from the completed door, could you joint the long edge of that door? You would have 
a very long, um, probably what are most doors, about seven feet, seven feet long, you would have a very long piece that you need to joint one long edge. Would you be able to work on the end of that door? Is that you know swelling and, and expansion contraction happens seasonally? A lot of times when the doors stick in their frames, it's along that that top edge that's swelled on the on the top rail. Well, now I've got a seven foot piece standing vertically. How do I work on that end? How, how am I going to tackle that? And then face, I've got a face that's probably as large as my workbench. How am I going to secure that to work on the various aspects of the face? That's an extreme example where you've got a really, really large piece, but being able to hold that, if your, your workbench can pass the door test, then it pretty much can handle anything. But what I've discovered over time is it's not always about vices. We immediately want to jump towards a vice, a front vice, leg vice, twin screw vice, in vice, wagon vice, shoulder vice. I'm probably forgetting some. We're very, very excited about vices, but what I've discovered more often than not is hand planes and hand saws often will produce more force on the board than a lot of power tool operations. At least power tool operations where you're taking the tool to the wood. You know, if you're taking the wood to like a table saw, well, there's a hell of a lot of power behind that table saw blade that can cause nasty kickback. But in the terms of work holding on a bench, now we're always taking the tool to the wood. So a circular saw or a scroll saw or even a router where you're taking the tool to the wood, they actually exert a lot less force than a hand plane would. And if you ever want to try this out, set a board down flat on the face and clamp it in place with a couple hold fasts or clamp it with just regular um, C-clamps and route uh, a profile along the edge. Now come in and actually try to remove a full width, full length shaving with uh, a jack plane or a scrub plane or a four plane with a heavy cut. You'll find that that board is gonna shift a lot more readily with the hand plane than it will with the router. Certainly than it will with a circular saw or with a scroll saw. So hand tool work holding actually becomes that much more important than we might automatically think with higher horsepower, higher torque type tools. Actually, higher torque might be debatable. Um, <clears throat> there is a lot of force put forth by these guys. Hand sawing. <clears throat> As you saw a tenon and you've got a board, I'll just lock it in my leg vise here, and you've got a board set up on this end and I'm sawing across that end, this board will want to rock down because we're actually ex exerting kind of a twisting force. The, the force of the vise can only do so much. Now I've got leather lined jaws that resist quite a lot and I could really crank down on this leg vise and hold this firmly in place, but you would be surprised how much your board will start to shift because we're sawing it kind of off the strong axis, uh, axis of the vise. You know, the really, the strongest way this would hold would be straight across this way. And obviously any issue we have here would be from flexing the board, you might get a little vibration and that's just a matter of <coughs> dropping the board further down, holding it closer to the bench to eliminate that vibration. But that brings up a whole other issue of does your vise allow a longer board to be placed in it? Face vices are going to have a series of guide rails that can often prevent a board from sliding past that guide rail. You know, maybe that guide rail is six inches below the surface of the bench or usually much shorter than that. So it can only go in six inches or you slide it over to the side to pass the screw, but then you've got some major racking forces that cause the vise to not hold this firmly. Still, as we're working straight across where we've got the mass of the bench behind it, we've got a lot of forces being aligned. It's those off access type things that you'd be really shocked at how much force is applied. When I use my 48 inch frame saw, I can shift massive boards even though I'm cranking down on my leg vise. And the leg vise is probably one of the strongest vices for that. The um, alternative would probably be a wider twin screw vise where you can get much wider clamping force, something you might find on a Nicholson bench or, or actually on the joinery bench that my camera is sitting on right now, which I'll get to in just a little bit. So what I've discovered over the years is it's less about the vise because the vise can only exert so much pressure, especially when you're working off axis like this. You can really crank that thing down, 
But actually, one of my hand tool students, one of my hand tool school students the other day, discovered that cranking down on that leg vise while resawing can actually cause a bit of an issue because he was resawing a rough saw on board. As he cranked it down, it actually clamped out a bit of a bow across the width of the board, which may be great because now he's got a flat surface to to reference against the bench. But as he began to saw and that saw kerf essentially released the tension in the board, that cup began to come back and it was causing binding of the saw, but also causing the saw blade to want to drift a little bit. So in some ways, being able to clamp down harder can be a bit of an issue. We run into the same thing on my invice, which I will say right now, I rarely use my invice anymore. And I'll talk a little bit about why next, but as I run my invice down on the board, and I know I'm kind of far away from the camera at this point, but I can hold the board very firmly on my bench top. And the direction of force that is put on the board as I'm planing, for the most part, is in line with that bench dog. It's a very good thing to have that aligned. So as I come in here with a jack plane, just make sure I'm working with the grain here. Yes, I am. I can put a lot of force on this board because I'm right in line with that bench dog and I'm in line with really how the vise was designed to hold. Nice and firm and I've got full unobstructed access to the face of this board. But the minute we start to traverse this board and work across the grain, which I really don't want to do that on this board because I've already flattened it, but it will start to shift on you. Let me just back the cut out. So I've got a really light cut here, but as you're working across like this or directly across as you traverse, you may find that this board will want to shift, especially if you're coming in with a heavier set scrub or foreplane. This board is going to shift. It doesn't take much, just light taps of the mallet and you can see that board is shifting on you. So what you do, okay, well, let me crank down on the vise a little bit more. Well, if I look very closely along the edge of this board, I have now imparted a bow into the board. There is no gap under the center. Let me tighten this up. So again, we're firmly held in place. I've got no gap in the center, but just like a quarter turn of the vice wheel. And I now have imparted, I don't know how much, just a little bit of a gap under the board, but that does tell me that I've now bowed the board up. And that can actually cause problems where maybe you're holding a straight edge to it and you're seeing, oh, there's a, bow, there's a bow in that face. So you remove that bow and then you release the tension from it and that bow comes out and now you've got a concavity on the face. The extra clamping force that can be provided by a, a robust bench vise like this um, bench crafted end vise can actually be a bit of an issue. Moreover, that shifting problem can be really hard to counter. So usually the way we encounter or counter that if you were traversing this board is I would come in with some kind of batten behind it. I would set another board behind it and probably hold fast that in place so that this board acts like a fence. So now I've got a firm passive stop behind here and I don't have to exert a whole bunch of force in the face vise and I can work all the way across. The issue you have to worry about here, of course, is these iron hold fast sitting back here. You'd be surprised how very easily it is to whack the plane into that. I doubt you're going to harm your blade, but you could you know, ding up the toe of your blade, possibly even crack uh, a cast iron sole if you get a little too carried away with it. Uh, or if nothing else, you whack the whole fashion, you might even knock the thing free. But this batten is kind of the first clue to tell me that there's probably a better way to work for face, face work on a bench. Um, so what I started to do a couple years ago 
is kind of ditch the whole idea of clamping a workpiece to hold it in place and more restrain the workpiece to hold it in place. No matter how much I clamp, I'm always going to run into a situation where I'm exerting more force than the, uh, than the, the clamp can handle. So instead, I now have a planing stop down here on the end. Just a simple, a um, little bit shy of a quarter inch thick, two dog holes, and it drops right in place on the end. You can make them as wide as you bench. Some people will actually put it on the end of the bench that it slides up. I uh, say that I don't think that's quite the best idea because you still are putting force off the end of the, the bench and you're relying upon the, however you have it attached to the bench. Um, you're also relying upon the stiffness of that board across a thinner dimension. Here, I've got two dog holes providing a very firm passive stop. And the entire board runs up against the edge and I can't see that in grain. I can't see that grain at all. Yeah. So now I can make a pass here and this board won't move on me. This board needs to be flattened. Of course, I'm taking like a thousandth of an inch shaving. Now I'm creating a substantial amount of force here and the board's not moving because the force is all in the same direction. Now, if I were to slot the board over and plane on this end, it's gonna wanna turn on me and, and, and rotate because there's no support behind that edge of the board. That's why I slide it over. And I keep telling myself one of these days I may make a wider planing stop, but honestly, this has been perfect. I just, I've gotten in the habit, if I've got a much wider board, I just did in the habit of moving the board around and making sure that the direction of force has support right behind it the entire way. And this could be the same thing if I needed to work across the grain, I could simply turn the board and work across the grain. Or now is when you can use that whole batten idea again. There goes my edge planing stop. So now I can use another batten. And if you've seen my video on dog hole placement, you can see that I'm a big fan of having a row of dogs back here in kind of the back third of the bench top. And now I've got an inside corner that's all passive stop. Punched up against the planing stop and firmly up against the batten that I just created and I'm good to go. Most importantly though, this board is not secured in place. I can very easily lift this board up, check the grain direction, check it under raking light, hold it up to a straight edge very easily. You know, certainly you can do the same thing by putting the straight edge down here, but then you're, you're bending over. Who wants to bend over? You know, you can just pick the board up and sight down it very easily because it's not restrained in place. And you may think, well, a vise is just a matter of loosening the vise. You'd be surprised how much how tedious that becomes if you're constantly picking the board up. And my whole spot planing method relies heavily upon constantly checking the surface of the board. We, the humans operating these machines, are the weakest link in this system. We're the ones causing error. This plane, especially this is a Lee Nielsen plane, this sole is so ridiculously flat, way flatter than anything I actually need. This is creating a flat surface. It's me, the weight, the body mechanics that I impart to We'll call this perfect machine that causing a board to go out of flat or creating a taper on the end. And the way to control that, to keep this air producing meat sack in check is to constantly check your work. So if you find that you're planing along, you pick the board up, you hold a straight edge to it, and you see, oh, I'm low on this side. Well, then I know don't plane in that spot. Plane the high spots over here, focus on some little spots here to move it down, check it again, you know, two, three passes and keep checking it. So you find yourself constantly picking up the board or constantly flipping of an edge and checking the squareness of the edge. And every single time you do that, if you have to loosen the vise, what you find you're doing is not checking as often. So you think, oh, I'll just take three more passes and then I'll move the vise. Well, the real thing, especially with face planing, 
not, well, edge planing as well. When you start to create an error, say I've started to create a taper on one end of the board, that error will quickly compound. It's not a, a linear curve, it's an exponential curve that will get worse and worse and worse real fast. Because, say in the case of this board, I'm creating a taper, I'm thinning it on the, the side closest to the camera. The steeper that taper gets, the more actual weight is getting put into the, the toe as you're planing downhill. And that little added weight will actually create a deeper or a thicker shaving. And it will suddenly start to get real bad real fast. This is exasperated on an edge where you've got a very small surface. And if you've got, say, a low side and the plane is planing it at an angle, that plane will continue to want to lean into that low side. Gravity is working with you in that case, and it will very quickly turn that slight bevel into a dramatic bevel unless you're checking and, and fixing that, altering whatever body mechanic that's causing that issue. So again, not only is the passive stop stronger and holding the board in place, but it's more, um, more simpatico with what we're trying to do with constantly checking the board um, for those errors. Same thing applies with sawing. Now I've got a, a very strong leg vise and I would not trade in my leg vise for the world. I use it constantly because it's, it's right here. It's very easy. It's fantastic for you know, edge planing work. Um, this leg vise actually passes the door test when it comes to uh, a long piece. It's got enough holding power that I can clamp a board and plane it all the way down here without it shifting. But say it's not, say it wasn't, say I had my um, um, alignment pin at the bottom not adjusted properly. So I wasn't getting the angle of the chop was maybe too extreme and it wasn't putting full clamping pressure on the force. See, I don't have a crisscross mechanism. This vice predates, well, the modern crisscross versions of the original crisscross. It doesn't predate that. But so I still have the, the, the old school, you know, ghetto fabulous alignment pin that you got to bend over and adjust. If I don't have that adjusted properly, the holding power of the vise is affected. But what you'll find instead of necessarily clamping down on that vise more in order to support a long board back here, the best thing you can do is pop a dog hole or a dog out of the bench, drop it in one of the holes on the leg back here and rest the board on that peg. It doesn't have to be clamped to the bench. It just needs to rest on there because the force that I'm applying, the force with the plane is that way. Well, I've got the leg vise down on that end holding in place. The other force I'm providing, especially way out here on the end of the board, is straight down. And because I've got such a long lever, it doesn't require very much pressure down. You really shouldn't be pushing down with your planes, but, but the length of that lever requires very little force to actually cause it to shift down. So just having it passively resting on a dog is enough. And this is where the Nicholson style workbenches with the big wide apron and all the rows of dog holes in the front are absolutely brilliant because you've got so many places to stick a peg. Um, I've got holes down the legs of my, my, uh, my Rubo here, but I don't have any holes in between. Um, what I can do is I could run a clamp underneath the bench and clamp a board across, um, but that requires getting clearance underneath that board. And if I've got a really wide board, it can sometimes be difficult. I can't drop it down low enough for the same reason that a face vise causes problems with guide rails and allowing the board to drop too far. What I can do though is something real simple is stick a board underneath it that touches the floor. All you need is like a, you know, a small one by two or something like that, that it can actually stand on end and provide a stop for that board. We actually call that a board jack where, you know, it's just, it's, it's like a jack. It's just a vertical piece that's actually standing passively in place and preventing the board from sliding down. The other thing that I have on my bench that one of the reasons that I've never gone to any steps to add dog holes along the, the, um, center span is I have a sliding leg vise. This is something I built when I initially built this bench. This is the same setup as the leg vise here, but obviously it slips into a groove that's underneath my bench and it rides on a V-shaped rail on the bottom. And I can slip it in place and 
it slides up and down the bench and I can provide two points of clamping power for that long board. If I run into a situation like that, I built a king size bed a while ago where I had, oh, what were they? About seven, seven or eight foot long rails, seven foot rails, I think. Um, a big uh, 10 quarter cherry. And I was able to bring this guy to bear in order to clamp it in two places. And now I've really doubled the clamping power. So that's, this is a nice thing to have. Um, honestly, there was a question in the chat room about if I rebuilt my bench, would I change anything? Um, I wouldn't add an invoice. I really like this guy, but it really doesn't get used that much. So this would, this sliding leg vise would probably go on my list for a future improvement and probably would never get built because it just, it's cool, but yeah. Um, and also I constantly move it to the other side because it does get in the way unless you are working, you know, um, a longer board, I'm constantly bumping into the thing. So come on, I've got so much debris under my bench. There we go keeps bumping into straight edges and things down there. So it is kind of nice to have over on the other side of the bench, because now I just have another vise that I'm off camera, I realize, but I have another vise on the other side of the bench that is beneficial if I ever want to, you know, set up a bench hook over there or do some sawing operations over there. That's something that I probably wouldn't build again because it's really superfluous. The end vise was way too much trouble to install. And for the reason that I just said with a planing stop, it's so much easier. If I am sticking a molding, I'm gonna use a sticking board. And that's another one of these little jigs that we like to have in the hand tool shop. Got a frame saw in the way. So I've got a nice long sticking board because generally when I cut moldings, my bench is starting to look like Roy Underhill. <clears throat> when I'm cutting moldings, I'm wanting to cut a longer run of molding so that, you know, I can miter out the individual pieces. If you've got, you know, a typical armoire or something like that, that is relatively deep, say 24 inches deep, you may have 24 inches deep, maybe 36 inches wide, that could very quickly become four, seven, seven, eight feet of molding required in order to just frame out that cabinet. So this sticking board, it has a cleat on the end so that it grabs on the opposite end of my bench. So it's not attached in place or anything. And what I do is I've got this row of dog holes that was originally designed to line up with my invoice. That's actually kind of beneficial. Even though I don't use the invoice anymore, this row of dog holes is really nice because I can just pop up a couple of dogs and now the sticking board is pushed up against those dogs. It's hung off the back, so the direction of force while I'm sticking the molding is this way, but there's also a substantial amount of force up against the fence. As I'm using a hollow plane, for example, I'm not really, I'm not using the hollow plane or rarely am I using the hollow plane where it's vertical. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's at some off angle creating a bead. So I am, my direction of force is certainly forward, but it's very much into the fence. And you'll quickly discover if I were to pop these dogs down and, and not use them, the whole thing would want to slide over on the bench. So if you didn't have a row of dogs, you could put another cleat on the front edge of the sticking board and just hang it over the front of the bench so that it prevents it. But you also notice that's exactly why there's a fence here. As I'm sticking a piece of molding, I've got a little stick of molding up here somewhere. Yeah. Let's just use a thin board. As I'm sticking a molding on this, I've got it pressed up against the fence on the sticking board, and then I have screws down here in the end that work as adjustable stops. And I can screw the screw in to lower the stop or unscrew it to raise the stop. So I'm providing, um, again, unobstructive access to the surface of this. But just like how I like to lift up the board and check it as I'm just flattening it, I'm doing that like 10 times more as I'm sticking molding. 
because I'm constantly seeing am I, how am I, I usually scribe the profile I want to create on the end of my board, on both ends of my board, so that I'm just looking, sighting down it, making a pass with a plane coming up, looking how am I close to my layout lines, etc. always picking the board up. So I really don't want to clamp this guy in place. Moreover, the minute I start clamping a board in place, I lose access to the entire face. A lot of times the molding stock that I'm cutting tends to be like this, like narrow stock. So even if I were to use a hold fast or something to clamp the back end, it would get in the way as I was rounding it over with the hollow. So without those screws on the end, you'll see I've got such a light cut here, the board's barely moving. But there we go. See, it's already starting to move without, you know, with very little effort, just these tiny little shavings, the board's moving along. So this entire sticking board relies upon that principle of a passive stop. The reason that I'm kind of harping on this is it's very good news. You know, woodworking can be expensive for a lot of reasons. When it comes to work holding, you don't necessarily need to get caught up in, this, in really expensive vices because a lot of times the vices don't do an adequate job. But what does a great job is boring a hole in your bench, grabbing a bit of hardwood dowel, sticking in there. If you want to get real fancy, you can cut a, a cross cut the face and then split out or, or cut out a little flat, you get even fancier and you add a little um, ball catch mechanism, just drill a hole and hammer that sucker in. And now I've got a ball catch that um, gives me a little bit of tension. I drop it in and the ball catch allows it to kind of stay in place very nicely there. I've, I've got a bunch of these that I bought years ago from Time Warp Tool Works, and then I've got probably 12 more that I just made myself from um, oak dowels. Uh, this is a Time Warp one because it's made out of ash. But all the oak ones I have just came from three quarter inch oak dowels bought at the Home Depot. The ball catch mechanism, I want to say I got them at Home Depot, but you can get them at you know, uh, Woodcraft, Lee Valley online. Um, you can get them even cheaper than that at places like McFeely's and online hardware sources. So you can have, you know, any number of these dogs to use as passive stops. I don't necessarily have to have a planing stop to do face work. This is a little bit more shall we say, not tedious, but requires a little bit more patience if I am just planing into a dog. It's just a matter of putting my plane right behind the dog. And then if I want to move over, I'll just move the board over a little bit and plane right behind the dog. Move the board, plane right behind the dog. And you can see it's very little effort to shift the board back and forth, but I'm planing into a central point and there's very little force or very little effort required to move the board around. The other thing about keeping the board un, the keeping the board loose on the surface is as you're planing, if the board moves on you, that is an indication of something that's going on with your planing stroke. So if I'm planing along and suddenly the, the board lifts up on the back, you may hear this a lot, you hear that noise because as the plane comes off the end, it's causing the back, the tail of the board to lift up and then drop down. That's an indication that I am putting a taper in this board. I'm exerting too much force on the back end or I'm rounding over that edge because I'm putting too much weight on the knob. Um, what I find this happens more often than not is people don't move their feet and they get into a longer board, they will start cutting and instead of moving their feet, they just extend their body out. Well now, my body, first of all, this is really hard on your back, really tiring on your shoulders, but there's all kinds of cantilevered weight. My center of gravity is way back here, but I'm leaning way out over top of this and it's putting a heck of a lot of force right on that knob. So I'm actually taping a, a thicker shaving on this end of the board than I am down here or I'm more in line with my center of gravity. I'm not pressing down on the board too much. The way to correct that is by actually moving your feet with the board as you come along, trying to keep that plane kind of cocked in closer to your hip 
that's gonna transfer the planing force from your shoulders and your arms into your legs and, and your butt, frankly. So just hearing that little click noise, that little clap noise is an indication that I'm putting too much weight on the far end of the stroke. If the board is clamped in place on a vise, you won't hear that. Here's the other thing, as I am planing around a board, anytime it's moving offline, planing is a single force action. Other than a little bit of force down, it is straight in that line. And if you find the board is rotating on you, you may, you may be skewing the plane, you may be doing weird stuff with your body mechanics that could be causing a board to go out of flat. You can't tell that if the board is clamped in place. So um, this is this single point action, working into a single point is really a good indicator of what I might be doing wrong with my planing stroke. You could actually do the same thing on an edge. This gets a little bit more precarious because we're balancing on a, on a narrow, what is this, about a 5 8 inch thick board. But here, as I'm planing, it's real easy to exert too much force and cause that tail to jump up on you. And that is how you're going to end up tapering a board very easily and creating a bowed surface. But proper mechanics say that Right about now, when the tail is on the board, I should be having equal pressure both on the front and on the back of the plane. And as I come to the end of the board, I should have no pressure on the tote, or excuse me, on the knob, and all the pressure on the tote. And if you're doing that, you will have the board freely restrained, and it won't jump up on you. But if you really are manhandling this, this is such a narrow board, it really doesn't want to stand up. If you're really manhandling it, or more importantly, grabbing the knob in your fist, it's gonna jump on you. And it's gonna make that little clatter noise behind you. I just threw that board out of, out of uh, true by putting too much force on the far end. Whereas proper planing technique, it doesn't jump on you. And that's a silly little sensory thing that tells me that I'm providing, I'm putting the weight on the toe of this plane and it's not moving on me. Even though it may be precariously balanced on a 5 8 inch thick edge, the fact that it's not jumping up is, is a great sign, a very good indicator. Also, if you don't have a leg vise, you can build one of these bird's mouth fixtures. Now I have a, in my particular bird's mouth, I have a fence set on it just to allow me to clamp it in my leg vise. I don't really know why I did that because it's not really necessary. Um, what I do is press it up against my planing stop and then I guess just for giggles, I clamp it in my leg vise. Even if I didn't clamp it, I've got a fence here that prevents the whole fixture from rotating over. And then I've got two little wedge shapes that if I switch to a different camera here, you can get a better feel of it. These wedge shapes take that, you know, precariously balanced board we had before, I slide it into the bird's mouth and the wedges come in from either side and it clamps that sucker firmly in place. It's not going to move and I don't have to worry about it necessarily tipping one side or another. The good news, however, though, is it's really easy to free. First of all, I just pull back and it comes free. And I can push it back in, slide the wedges in place, and we're locked. Also, that same thing we we're talking about, but the tail of the board tipping up, it will still happen here because I'm not restraining the board. So if I've got improper technique, it will still lift up in the end. And it was a little bit more subtle there, but you can still feel that board lifting up because I didn't See, there we go. So it doesn't actually restrain it. It's more of the wedges are keeping the board from rocking from side to side. And it's real easy to pick it up, take a look at that edge, stick it back in here, slide the wedges in, and I'm good to go. This is a great uh, edge planing fixture. It's also, uh, this, the, the drawback obviously is when boards start to get really wide. When you start getting a 12 inch board, then I'm, I'm up higher as I'm planing can be a little bit difficult but it's really effective for very narrow boards where if I were to try to clamp a narrower board in my leg vise, 
I may not have that much to hold on to because the board is, is quite narrow. This is almost three inches thick, so it's not really that much of an issue. And I am going the wrong direction with the grain. But this can be real beneficial when you've got a narrow piece like this, like one inch, one inch wide. This is fantastic. As you can see, obviously, the narrower the board, the more stable the whole thing becomes. Holds it nice and firmly. You gotta love this stuff. This is called Shedua. It's an African hardwood. Beautiful stuff. Also, really, really high in silica, so it does dull your blades kind of bad, like way more than teak ever, ever will. The, the last kind of point, and I'm, I'm harping on this whole passive restraint thing, um, and I'll shut up in a second. If there are questions about vices, I'm happy to talk about it. But probably one of the most effective work holding jigs, appliances, whatever in your shop is a bench hook. And this particular bench hook, I call this my pairing hook. Um, I guess bench hooks in general tend to be thought of in the realm of sawing. This hook has a very shallow fence. It's only about a quarter of an inch high. So it allows me to take most of the boards I'm working on and press it up against the fence. I can cut a dado on this very easily. If I really wanted to restrain this, um, I can use it in conjunction with a hold fast. So now everything is locked in place and it won't slide. If I've got a, an operation, like say I was cutting a miter here where the force is not straight against the fence, but adds some angle, you may find that the whole thing wants to slide a little bit. Even more reason why I can take a dog, pop the dog up. So now the bench hook is running up against the dog, this dog right here, to prevent the whole thing from sliding back and forth. Just a simple passive straight. In addition, the cleat on the underside of this is running up against the fence. Just the other day though, I was actually milling up these narrower pieces. And while I could have very easily used my planing stop and worked up against it that way, excuse me, it's off camera, but and used the planing stop working along the face, I just pushed them up against the fence of my bench hook and I plane them straight away from me. And you'll find that especially really short pieces, necessarily lining up along the bench can sometimes cause, um, it's, it's a little bit inefficient. Whereas working straight across is a lot more comfortable, especially with small parts like this. Having that um, lower fence was fantastic. Really easy to sit here and plane this. And there's nothing holding this in place, but that fence. Really easy to pick it up, check it with a straight edge, do whatever you want with it, juggle with it, whatever. Um, more importantly, flip it over, real easy, check the grain, all that fun stuff. Real easy done right up against the bench. This bench hook also is incredibly useful for layout. You might not think about that. You may think of layout as a very static thing, but anytime you can push your board up against a fence so you've got it held in place and then come in with your square, and with my square, I'm actually pushing up against that fence and now I can run a knife along here and mark it. Whereas if I'm kind of out here in space, you find that sometimes you can't put the same pressure on the fence and the blade may want to skew on you. Having it right up against a surface like this, held in place, or if you really want, locked in place with a hold fast, will make your layout that much more efficient. This kind of, this bench hook kind of becomes like a supplemental workbench top. And you'll notice I've got all kinds of holes and dings and everything in here where I've bored through things or chiseled into it. <clears throat> Not that, of course, I have plenty of those on my actual workbench itself where I've done that over the years. But this kind of acts as that uh, supplemental surface to do all kinds of joinery operations. If necessary, I can press this into use as a, a regular old sawing hook where I can come over and saw right on the edge, sawing all the way across, or if I'm sawing out a dado. Um, yeah, this thing gets used basically every single day in my shop on every single project. So what this does, this transforms our 
seeking for the perfect bench and it turns your workbench into a horizontal surface. Now, ideally a workbench is going to be massive that it's not going to move around the floor on you because as I said there's a lot of force being applied by these planes and these saws. But really I just need a flat surface. I don't even really need the dog holes although I use them a lot. Having something like a bench hook gives me all the, the forces that I really need and you could just run you know a regular old quick clamp or something or on the back side of a table to clamp a board in place if necessary. The bench hook becomes the workbench and it solves a lot of the problems that people may not have if you don't have a workbench yet just because it's got a fence, a passive restraint like that. Um, sawing. This workbench obviously is set up to live kind of to function around my leg vise. If I were at uh, my in-laws place in Maine where I was using my Nicholson bench, you'll see that as I set up a board to saw a tenon, since I don't have a face vise, what I do have though is aprons on the front with various pegs. And I can put a peg in place, I specifically have a peg right here on the front edge that I can lean a board up against for sawing a tenon. I also have a whole bunch of peg holes around it that I actually can put pegs on either side of it and kind of wedge it in place or use a hold fast further down the leg in one of those peg holes to actually clamp it against the workbench. The force of the saw is being absorbed by the peg, that passive restraint back here. The hold fast is really just holding it fast, holding it steady. The hold fast is not really resisting the force. It's this immovable oak peg behind it that's doing all the work. Now, you may find that's a little bit more cumbersome to deal with than just something like a leg vise, which is why I love this thing so much, but leg vise can be added later. And when I get to things like my 48 inch resaw, I've found that if I'm resawing a really wide board, like 15, 20 inches wide, the amount of force created by that big blade cutting through all that wood at the same time, this leg vise starts to fail on me. Um, it, uh, it will start to shift and it's just a little bit, but ever so slowly the board starts to shift down on access. Whereas if I just stick a peg behind it, fixes it immediately because now the force is being taken up by that um, passive object, that immovable object, rather than the clamping force of the vise. So more often than not, when I'm resawing now, I rely more upon pegs than I do on the vise. And I tend to resaw on the other side of the bench a lot because I don't have a vise over there, but I've got a row of dog holes that runs all the way down. I have a twin screw vise that Andy Klein has made. If you guys have seen this super fancy uh, turbo geary looking vise that I'm going to install on the back side of the bench um, at some point in the future, that will do a good job because it is a twin screw. Um, but that's, we're talking like sheer luxury at that point. Which brings me to my last point. The Twin screw vise. This is a, a, essentially a Moxon vise. Um, this is a bench crafted Moxon set that's been set up around this chop. This is my, my joinery bench. Camera is actually sitting right up here. Um, this is my dovetail guy. I do pretty much all of my dovetailing here because it's really the perfect vise for this operation coming in and sawing right across this direction. It holds it super, super firmly. I even, while I'm grabbing it this way, can do a little bit of work along the edge if I were rounding over an edge. The beauty of this vise is that it's set up high, in my case, about 45 inches off the floor or right about elbow height for me. It's really the perfect operation for joinery. This holds really strongly. Um, if I wanted to resaw a wider board, this is too high, way too high for, for my purposes. But um, say the whole thing were dropped down a little bit lower, the clamping power of this twin screw is so much that any torque created by the, the big frame saw is it's handled it. I mean, this joiner bench is quite massive, but I would actually shift the joiner bench around if I tried to resaw at it, which is why I know that if I use a twin screw vise in the back side of my bench, it's going to be more of a optimal solution for wide resawing. And I'm talking about wide resawing. 
you know, boards 10 inches and under, even 12 inches and under, my leg vise handles it just fine. Um, easy question. Would it be worth putting a crochet on your Nicholson bench versus the leg vise? Um, if you don't know what a crochet is, it's essentially a, a hook that sits out on the front that acts the same way this bird's mouth fixture acts. So imagine one side of this is flat or that's what the wedge does. If you slide the wedge in place, now I've essentially got a crochet. So as the board comes in, it's wedged in place by this decreasing angle, but it's also not only prevented from the passive stop, but it's prevented from, it's pushed up against the bench. And the crochet would sit right where my leg vise is. On my Nicholson bench in Maine, I may end up putting a crochet on it. I will, I'm not gonna install a leg vise because I only work on the thing like maybe four weeks out of the year if I'm lucky. Maybe someday um, I'll be able to do more time on it, but um, I would probably put a crochet in first. To be honest though, I've gotten so used to the way I've got various peg holes and there's like six different holes right in this area at various heights because the apron on that Nicholson runs right up to the edge and it's 12 inches wide or 11 and a half inches wide technically. So I've got all kinds of different peg holes there and all the way down the leg that for the most part, between that and a hold fast, it's okay. The issue with a crochet is, yes, it prevents the board from sliding and it presses up against the bents, but you really do need some additional clamping force further back on the board. Unless it's a really short board, you need something else. Now, it may just be a peg that it's actually resting on. That may work just fine. But what I find is I'm using, I usually have a hold fast always kind of living in that leg of that bench that I can use not only as a passive stop, as a peg for it to rest on, but clamping force to prevent any additional um, movement in the board. Um, yeah, it's something that I'll think about uh, in the future. I've gotten so used to the way I've got set up now that frankly, I've become very efficient with it. Uh, but yeah, crochet is a very, uh, a very good option. Um, if I were to redo my workbench, I think I answered that one. I really wouldn't change much. The beauty of the Rubo or the Nicholson um, or the, the Moravian styles, I mean, they're so massive. They're kind of a blank slate chassis. The chassis itself is robust and strong. It's not going to shift. It's not going to vibrate. It's not going to move around on you. And the, the vices and the dog holes is just the trimmings that go onto it. And the Rubo is flexible enough that I could add multiple vices in any number of locations. I've got really stout legs that I can continue to put dog holes in. So there's really not much I would change other than I wouldn't bother with the end vise. I just don't use it anymore. Um, and I wouldn't go to the effort of building the sliding leg vise. Not that it's bad, it just doesn't get used as much. It was a lot of effort to do that and a heck of a lot of stock because that's 12 quarter ash that the thing's built out of. I could have saved a lot of time and a lot of money on that. How about a sliding board with bench dog holes instead of a sliding vise? A sliding board with bench dog holes instead of a sliding vise. You mean like a sticking board? I'm not sure what you're asking there, Carl. Um, I mean, I'm sure that would work if I'm understanding what you're asking. Uh, there's any number of little bench jigs that you can build. I mean, a sticking board is another bench jig that's used for a very specific operation, sticking a molding. If you find yourself in a situation where you are working with a lot of long boards and you need that extra support back here, some kind of jig that you would stick to the front of the bench that would have various peg holes in it would be fine, kind of like a, a temporary apron, that would be just fine. Um, I've found that, that comes up so rarely in just day-to-day -day furniture work that um, you know the leg vise, the sliding leg vise works fine for me, but I've also found myself in certain situations where I've been too lazy to go pull the sliding leg vise from the other side, or I'm using that leg vise over there for something else, like maybe something just as simple as I've got a, a shooting board clamped in it to keep it from sliding around on the bench, and I will grab like a regular old bar clamp. I don't think this one's long enough, but I'll just grab a bar clamp, run it underneath the bench, 
and clamp the board in place, and that works just fine. Um, here's your sliding board that would clamp instead of a sliding leg vise, which is again why I say I wouldn't build a sliding leg vise again. It's cool, very high coolness factor. The applications of it are, you know, I guess if you built doors all day long or you used a lot of situations where, well, you know what, before I built my joinery bench, it was great to have two leg vices for wider boards. Like if I wanted to do dovetailing, I could clamp one here, put in the other vise, and it worked great. Um, since I built the joinery bench and I've got 26 inches of capacity between the screws, is not necessary anymore. So you might find yourself using it more often than not. Um, you'll just find that really there's a, um, a lot of different jigs and appliances and things you can come up with. I haven't even mentioned things like the doze foot. Doze foot is a batten with a V groove stuck on the end. It's very useful for kind of grabbing, capturing the back corner of a board. So if I've got my board running up against my planing stop, it can still rotate from side to side if I'm working diagonally or something. The doze foot comes in at an angle. It's held to the bench using a hold fast and it just cradles the back corner and it prevents them from sliding around. The reason I don't have one is the spot planing method I use for all of my planing now does not require me to plane really ever off of the long axis of the board. All of my planing is with the grain because I'm not, I'm not traversing, I'm not doing the diagonal up and back thing anymore. That's planing by rote. It's trying to apply a, you know, a formula to a unique surface. This board's topography is different than this board's topography and different from every board's topography out there, unless you run it through a planer, in which case, why are you hand planing it? So trying to apply the exact same formula to every single board, it's just inefficient. So now what I do is identify the high spots and I plane it away. And I'm working always with the grain of the board. Never am I working off axis where I have any twisting operations. So I've never built a doze foot. I built one in, in Maine on the bench that I have up there. And I discovered that I don't use it because I have a center notch down my bench that actually has a planing beam that slides up and down. So it acts the same way as putting this batten behind it. I can actually lift that planing beam up and provide an inside corner. What that also does is it gives me a sticking board built into my workbench if I do molding work up there. How do you hold drawers without a tail vise? Why would I need a tail vise to hold drawers? How do you hold drawers without a tail vise? Oh, like already assembled drawers? So I guess if you have a tail vise, you would drop the whole thing in the drawer. Yeah, how I do that is, do I have a drawer? I don't have a drawer. Well, what I do is I take a board, piece of scrap board, I run it up against my planing stop, or actually this dog hole right here on the front edge, I actually use this a lot for sawing. Um, I run the board up against that dog. Where did my mallet go? No, oh, I put it away. And lock the board down. So now I have a passive stop and I sleeve the drawer over it. I slide the drawer over this piece that's hanging off the edge and the drawer front runs up against it and I can plane the edge of the board down. Um, then I can slide the drawer off, flip it over, flip it around, flip it one side or the other. I can actually get access to all four sides of the drawer just by hanging it off this thing. Um, and again, the force is all in the same direction. If say I've got a dovetailed face that I wanna work across the, the pins, I can run that drawer, sleeve it over here, run the drawer up against the top of the, against the front of the bench, and I've got the ability to work into the bench, but then also along this way, just by using a passive stop. Yeah, I've, I've never had a tail vise on this bench. I've got that, essentially that would be called a wagon vise or in vise, but there is no, no tail vise. I've always just used that sleeving method to, to hold it. Again, it's a passive stop. 
And I find also very, very useful because when I'm doing a drawer like that, nine times out of 10, I'm taking a pass, checking the fit on the case, taking another pass, checking the fit. So I'm constantly moving the thing back and forth. If you've got that whole drawer, you know, slotted into a, an, an invoice and I'm, you know, undoing the thing, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's an extra step that frankly, I, I'm either too lazy or I'm just too impatient. I just don't like dealing with that. So yeah, I use the sleeve more than anything else. The other thing with the tail vise is the tail vise has a limitation in its capacity. So some of them have a really long screw and can come out a long, long way, but nine times out of 10, they're quite limited. So if you've got a drawer that's maybe eight inches deep, that may be a problem. You're not gonna be able to grab it in there very well. Also, you're, you're clamping it down to hold it in place, which is always a possibility that you could end up deforming the sides, especially because drawers tend to have thinner stock for their sides, especially me. I love to make really thin three eighths and under inch thick uh, drawer sides. If you're clamping it, you could be cupping it. So again, if I'm just working passively against a stop, you know, I'm limited only by this length. If I've got an eight inch deep drawer, you know, this is probably 10 inches hanging over the bench right here. Obviously you need a stout board that's not gonna flex on you. That's just a matter of putting a little bit thicker board here in order to do that, or, you know, a piece of plywood or something like that. Or it doesn't even have to be that wide. You can use um, two different sticks set aside. You can actually use those sticks wedged apart to hold the drawer completely stable. So one stick is on the back of the drawer, one stick's on the front of the drawer, and the drawer custom slides over it. You know, no limit in capacity. The only limit in capacity is the length of my workbench there. So yeah, the, the invoice I just found to be way too limiting in that case. Cool. Well, that brings me to the end of an hour. Um, I think I got all the questions. If I missed something, it's because it's probably not in caps. So, um, any last questions? Do you still have a shave pony attachment? Yes, I do. I absolutely do. It's over there against the wall, just right there where my finger is pointing. It breaks down and folds up and lives right up against the wall and I use it when I need to. Honestly, I've got a, um, a shave horse that lives in my backyard next to my bungee lathe that uh, I tend to use more now because just the, the shaving work that I've been doing has been riving from a log and it starts out there and I kind of work it kind of the way I want it before I bring it into the shop. But every now and then I do pull out that shave pony and, and use it and it's very beneficial as well, especially if you don't have uh, a backyard where you can set up a, a shaving area, if you will. Um, sliding dead man in all caps. Oh, so when you're talking about sliding board, sliding dead man. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think it was Carl's question about the sliding board and the leg brace. Sliding dead man is just fine. And um, it's the same idea of having it's the Rubo version of the wide aprons on a Nicholson because all the sliding dead men is the board with a bunch of holes for pegs and it slides up and down the bench so that you can very easily adjust for that. Way more efficient than a sliding leg vise, especially when you start factoring in wooden screws, which I used or buying another, you know, like a you know, bench crafted face vise or something like that, or, or leg vise screw, really expensive. So yes, that's a very good, uh, very, very, um, cost-effective and very efficient idea. The, um, the big issue is you have to put a groove on the underside of your workbench top, which is not that big of a deal. Even if you've already built the workbench, the hardest part is actually flipping the monster. This is easily a 500 pound bench, flipping the sucker over so you can actually cut the groove. So obviously if you've thought of it before you build the bench, it makes things a little bit easier, but yeah, um, not, a, not a bad idea at all. Cool, well guys, thanks. Um, you know, as usual, I always forget all the, the advertisement stuff. I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to be marketing my own stuff and I always forget to do that. So uh, I've had quite a few people who have sponsored these live broadcasts lately over on Patreon. Thank you everyone who's been doing that. Um, got a couple of folks who have sponsored some upcoming topic shows. I even had a couple of people who um, have signed up for one-on-one uh, -on -one classes. It's all that stuff is available over at Patreon slash Renaissance Woodworker. And my little kind of thank you for those of you that tune in. If you are interested in learning more about hand tools, I have the Hand Tool School. It's a very comprehensive kind of structured approach to learning hand tools step-by-step. -step. 
And if you use the code RWWLIVE, you'll get 10% off any pro uh, product over there. So thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, it's always a pleasure to spend my Wednesday evenings with you. So um, what size are the boards on my top? Uh, I think they were eight quarter when I started laminated together. My entire workbench build is documented on this channel. Granted, it was before things like 1080p existed. So a lot of those videos are in like 320p because high def didn't exist back then. And Google, YouTube and its infinite wisdom does not allow you to replace video. So I actually have some raw footage of that bench build that would be in higher definition, but I can't replace the video. So yay, it's still in older, um, older lower def. So if you can stand lower def, um, yeah, it's all there. You'll see how I glued up the entire bench top. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 boards of uh, eight quarter ash. Last two boards are actually 12 quarter, 10 quarter ash that make up my workbench. So yeah, it's a beast. It's a beast, but I love her. I use her every single day. So thanks everybody. Um, Don, I've lost 110 some pounds or so. Which, by the way, if you've noticed I'm limping around, it's because I ran 40 minutes at threshold before this episode, and uh, the calves are a bit tight right now. So, all right, everybody. Thank you very much for hanging out. I'll uh, see you next week. Don't know what I'm going to talk about next week. If anybody has ideas, feel free to hit me up and let me know. See ya.